Uh, for those of you who are not in my session earlier, I'm Thomas Leeper, and I'm associate professor at the London School of Economics. Um, I'm going to basically just jump off exactly from where we, what we were just talking about, but transition into uh, an R framework. So who kind of has used R at least at some point in their life? OK, lovely. So uh, you know, it's the way to go. Um, <laughs> Uh, I actually, so uh, listening to Garrett, uh, I thought I would show a couple of examples of like other stuff first, just because in response to some questions that came up. So someone said, oh, can you include like LaTeX documents within LaTeX documents? Yeah, that, you should love LaTeX because that's exactly the kind of stuff you can do. So like this is a book that I'm writing. Uh, this is the main file. And then all of the chapters uh, are stored in their own files. So you can edit basically a standalone document, compile it, uh, by itself, or compile it into the larger thing. And you can play around with all the different pieces and reorder the chapters, oh, that should come before or after this other bit, without actually having to like touch the final document. You just say, this line goes here instead of here, and then you've got a totally different book. Um, so LaTeX is actually really fantastic exactly for that kind of stuff. And because both Stata and R, and I think SPSS and SAS and other tools as well, can kind of export these native LaTeX documents, you can just include those. So I make a table, you don't have to recompile all of the code, you just change that table and then it gets automatically incorporated. So it's like pretty pretty awesome stuff. Um, I'm not gonna talk much more about LaTeX. I just wanted to show that to you because I thought it was mildly interesting. Um, and also because it's an important kind of backstory to the history of dynamic documents in R. So uh, when I first started using R, um, we all created dynamic documents in this thing called S-Weave. Has anyone heard of S-Weave? Nerds, nerds, <laughs> nerds. <laughs> Nobody uses that anymore. Um, but then, like when I was in grad school, uh, this new thing came out uh, that was called Knit R or Knit R, depending on how you want to uh, pronounce it. And it has lots of like knitting-related um, iconography around it. Um, Knit R is a replacement for Sweeve. That was really awesome. And so, if you go on the internet and search dynamic documents in R, you get a ton of stuff about about Knit R. Um, but what's happened since then is the guy who created Knit R. Uh, is awesome, and this company called R Studio basically bought him, like, away from getting a PhD. Like, instead of getting a PhD, come and create uh, Knit R for everyone. So he and R Studio have now produced this product called R Markdown, um, which is free and open source, um, which is fantastic, but backed by a company that has a lot of venture capital. So they are actually investing a ton of money and effort in producing dynamic document technology in R that kind of satisfies all of R transparency and open source requirements. So it's really fantastic. Um, what R Markdown allows you to do that Sweeve and NIDR did not allow you to do is work not just in LaTeX. So Sweeve was a LaTeX only format. NIDR started trying to transition and work with other kind of outputs like Word and so forth. And now R Markdown can do all kinds of stuff. And you can create all of these different kinds of output formats from the same document. So if you want to produce a Word document and a web page and a PDF, and slides, you can actually do that from a single source document. Run all of your code in one thing and spit out these different formats that you might need for different kinds of um, producers. You want to have a web page about your research project, change one line of code, you get a web page. You want to have a PDF that you submit to a journal, change you know, HTML document to PDF document, now you've got a PDF without having to touch anything else or think about how those uh, formats are created. Um, our markdown is really magical because it's written in plain text. So those of you who were in my session caught me talking about readme.md as opposed to readme.txt as a file format. MD is markdown. So you can use any file extension, but, but markdown is a specific file format and one that is kind of like eerie because you might already be writing in it already, even if you don't realize it. So in this document, um, hash my manuscript is a heading simply putting this hash, when I process this file in the way that Garrett just did, you end up with a heading, and then my name, and then some text. It's a plain text file, but because you write it in Markdown, you end up with something that's formatted once it's processed. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of what that means. Um, basically, an R Markdown file consists of three individual parts. The first part is what we call a YAML metadata header, which you're all excited about which stores some kind of metadata about the document, like what its title is, who the author is, what data was produced. And then it contains document contents, just you know, the words that you're going to put into your manuscript or slides written in this markdown format, which is basically just plain text. 
and then something called uh, yeah uh, something called code chunks, and this is like the kind of Markdoc stuff that we were just seeing, where we embed code within uh, the body of the document. So uh, they look sort of like this. There are these backtick symbols. The the letter R, which tells us what language we're trying to process. A label for the chunk any code, and then end it with back ticks. And what happens is R Markdown looks at that, says that's R code, I'll process it as if it's just R code that you're typing at the command line, give you back the output, and then embed it in the resulting document, process the entire Markdown, and give you the output. It's so very, very similar to what Stata it released in Stata 15. They're basically trying to do R Markdown in Stata uh, much worse. <laughs> so this is a complete R Markdown document. You've got the YAML metadata header, so you've got these three dashes and then all of the metadata. So what this says is you're gonna produce a document with the title My Manuscript, the author is my name, the date is today, and the output format that we wanna produce is a PDF document. We have some text for the body of the manuscript itself, and we have a single code chunk that in this case produces a histogram. So uh, if people have RStudio on their computer, you can actually, uh, work along with me if you'd like. If you open up our studio and you tick in the upper left hand window where it says new, if you do new R markdown, it'll say, would you like to create a new R markdown document? Yes, I would like to do that. A window pops up that explains basically the, uh, the front matter. In this case, we wanna make a document. We'll call it my manuscript. It's already pre-populated my name because our studio is a bit smart like that. And I'll say I wanna produce a PDF. Just fill those in. It's going to pre-populate the YAML header. So you can see there, title, my manuscript, author, my name, date, today, the output format that I want to get is a PDF. And what it will actually do is give us a whole bunch of information kind of by default. So it's actually set up a little example markdown document that explains how markdown works. The first chunk uh, just sets up a little bit of code. Here we can see a header with two hashes. So it's a second level header, some text, a link, these asterisks, just like in the mark doc format from Stata, uh, indicate bold text. And you can see that it's included a code chunk, in this case that summarizes a particular data set called cars. So that's the simplest mark, uh, R markdown file you can produce. And uh, this is the kind of formatting you can attach to that. Italics, or sorry, that should be two asterisks to make it bold. Back ticks will make it pre-formatted. Headings, links, and so forth, okay? so. One of the, the weird things about working in the transparency space is you start learning a lot about file formats and how to mark up documents in all kinds of different languages. Our markdown is like probably the easiest one that you can possibly learn. Because I, I find that naturally you often do things like italicize things by putting asterisks around it. Or you think about putting a link with what it is. Sorry. Pretty straight, yeah. Are you using some of the files we have in the folder? Yeah, so you can, if you look at um, the, a uh, set of files that, that Garrett was just looking at, you can, he has a bunch of examples of our markdown. We'll pull one of these up in a second. But I was just showing you how our studio creates a new file, just so that when you walk through that exercise of creating a new mark, our markdown document, you see what's going on. Um, we can delete all of this, just to show you basically a really simple example. Um, I'll use this uh, code chunk. So you have to name all of your chunks. You don't technically have to do that, but it's much better if you do. Oops. Uh, yeah, lovely. And then I will just put in some code. So a uh, histogram of a you know, normal distribution of numbers. Perfectly simple document. If you go up to the top bar and hit knit, so note the knit button is R markdown, it's a legacy. If you hit that, you'll have to save this. Just save it as a file. Some stuff will happen down here in the console. It'll take a minute, basically processes all the R code, then processes the resulting document. And what you end up with is this. So there's actually a very complex dance that it's doing behind the scenes, which is processing your R code, converting that R code to markdown, processing the markdown, converting it through something called pandoc to LaTeX, processing the LaTeX into a PDF. But it's doing that in one button. And so all the tools that you can use in R, for example, to format tables, to format figures, and so forth, all of that 
is kind of naturally available. Because the back end of this is actually LaTeX, if you're already using a tool that generates like pretty LaTeX tables, you can continue to use that because that's how it's producing the PDF. Yeah? I was downloading packages. <coughs> Do you mind just going, going through that real quick? I'm sorry, about what? Can you just run through the, the process like went through? Of doing what? Generating the uh, Yeah, absolutely. So it's just that. You don't even really need this first chunk. I'll delete that for the sake of brevity. <laughs> you also don't technically need any of this other stuff, but anything you put in these back tick chunks is just regular R code. Yeah? Um, so it's telling me that I need to download back tech, but I have, so I go to the SMA. Is there a way you need to tell it that I have Yeah, so if you it? go into your, uh, I believe in your global options, you'll be able to, under R markdown, I believe, uh, somewhere you should be able to specify the path. I'll help you afterwards okay. if, uh, just so I don't totally lose track of things. Was there another question? Yeah. Exactly, so just like before with, um, this data product, we can uh, eliminate that as well. So the nice thing about using RStudio is if you don't know what all these options are called, they'll actually pop up automatically. So this is saying what all the things we could possibly use to regulate the behavior of this chunk. Um, so one of them that we might want in this particular case is echo. It says that can be true or false. We want it to be false. Uh, you don't want to see the code. You just want to see the output. So we'll run that again. It's processing the code. And now we've got just the histogram without the code that generated it. And that can be controlled in a whole bunch of different ways. So if you see, you know, there's a, a drop down list here of probably 100 different options for each chunk. Um, in the same way uh, as before, we can also embed um, code. So something like, you know, 2 plus 2 is hopefully 4 uh, if I set this up correctly. So we can. That code, which we just did backtick R and then any arbitrary R code whatsoever, so that could be a coefficient out of a model or something else, gets rendered as that value. So again, everything that Stata is doing in Stata 15 is basically trying to emulate the behavior of R markdown. Now there's a, a particularly cool feature which um, I'll show you here, which is that the jump from NIDR to R markdown also entailed the ability to do what are called multilingual documents. So when we create a code chunk and we put this R, we're telling R markdown that the contents of that chunk is R code. But we can also specify other languages, including things like Python or Stata. So in this example, I'm going to create an R markdown document that processes Stata code. I'll just show you what it looks like and then explain what's happening. So this looks very, very similar to what you were seeing from state of 15. This is generated through R. You still need to have Stata installed in your computer, so it's not getting you out of having a Stata license. But what's happening is this first chunk is saying, we want to process with a different engine other than R. We want to be able to process with Stata. And what does Stata do? Uh, Stata exists at this place on my computer. And every time I call a chunk with the Stata language, everything contained in there gets processed by Stata, spit back as results, and then processed, processed to the resulting document. Does that make sense? So even if you're a Stata user and you have no interest whatsoever in learning R as a programming language, you can learn R as a markup language for kind of better handling some of the, the output functionality uh, that isn't fully available in Stata. Yeah. Totally. So if it outputs, say, a tech file, if you are processing to a PDF, you can simply include arbitrary LaTeX code in this document. So the markdown will get processed, then the LaTeX will get processed and produce the PDF. I believe so. Yeah, so I don't know, you might be, I haven't played around with this like a massive amount, but you might be able to directly have it um, identify what that output file is called and everything. I'm not sure. Yeah. 
What do you mean? That is the risk data being efficiency. Okay. Yeah, so you can, so basically within the code chunks, you can use any arbitrary code. So um, it, whether that be Stata or R or Python or anything. So this is simply to produce the final document that you want to work with. Uh, it has nothing to do with how you work with the code itself. Does that make sense? And the, as I mentioned, the thing that's really nice about this is we can, in one simple change, produce a different kind of output. So switching from a PDF uh, to, sorry, uh, say Word, we just have to say Word document. And now we get something that opens in Microsoft Word that's basically substantively identical to what we saw in the PDF. So it's processing the markdown, and again, using this kind of magical tool called Pandoc, spitting out a Word document instead of a PDF. And we can also um, change that to HTML. And this is a web browser, so it's not totally obvious what's happening here, but that's an HTML document um, that's been produced. Um, Garrett has some really good examples here showing kind of all of these different output formats, um, including, I'll open this in the right tool. This is slides. Oh no. Inevitably the demo doesn't work. That's a classic tech problem. Okay, I'm confident that works except for some weird quirk on my computer. So in the, uh, the GitHub directory uh, under our markdown, there are all these different examples. So there's HTML, there's PDF, uh, and then this uh, slides example, which you should try to work through on your own. I'll figure out what the issue is um, on my own computer, but you can produce uh, slides as well, directly from that same document. It's basically the exact same thing, you just, um, if we look at this file, um, yeah, it's basically the exact same thing, yeah. Um, do you ever run into um, R Markdown being used with qualitative softwares, like in vivo or something like that? So I haven't seen that. Um, I imagine it might be possible. Um, I can actually, let's just, Google and uh, see what engines have already been implemented. Uh, assuming the Wi-Fi is actually functional. Python, SQL, Bash, RCPPP, Stan, JavaScript, CSS. I made it work with Stata like, by doing nothing, so I assume you can make it work with NVivo relatively simply as well. Questions about that? Exactly. Exactly. So if you if your output format is PDF, um, something uh, like this, That was written in Markdown. That was written in LaTeX. If your output format is PDF, the Markdown gets converted to LaTeX, and any LaTeX that's naturally in the document will just get processed along with that converted right. LaTeX formatting. Exactly. Um, one other thing I was going to show you was that this can be used for really complex documents as well. So it's you know, there's sort of a, a tendency to think maybe you can't write a really complicated project um, in something like R Markdown. Um, this file, which is 83 pages long, um, is a project I recently worked on. Every single number and graph and table in this document was generated from R Markdown. Um, the source code for that is not complicated. 
it's 1,300 lines long, which sounds like a lot, but considering that it's basically every imaginable analysis of this data set, um, and I really did nothing to format it into a PDF, um, it's pretty slick. It will fail. So you can configure how the errors are handled. It's either that they will generate an R level error, so the processing of the document will fail, or in certain cases, it will basically print uh, like a really visible, like bright red error message or warning message in the document itself. And you can regulate kind of which of those behaviors you'd prefer. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, our studios produce really detailed documentation for this. Basically, what you have to do, they've uh, pre-installed a few templates, um, but you can also create your own. Um, and basically, what it entails is in this header, instead of just saying um, like a bare HTML document, you want an HTML document that uses certain styling files. Um, and the formatting of that is not you know, trivial but it's also not that complicated. So does that mean that I have to look at my template and then figure out what the code is for that template and write the code to create my template? If you already have a template that's basically like insert text here, yeah. um, you should be able to pretty easily modify that. Got like lots of colors, sizes, and everything. Shouldn't be a problem, yeah. As long as it's got kind of like main part of text goes here, title goes here, and so forth. Basically, all you're gonna do is create placeholders written in the like language that our markdown recognizes. So you'll have to modify that document a little bit, but it shouldn't be enormously painful. Okay, so I modify my, like say my template's in Word, which I think it is, um, I modify that template mm -hmm. with these um, insert text here. So I don't have to create the code that um, inserts my logo. No, exactly. As long as you kind of give it the correct placeholders in the right places, it will it will find them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, in terms of learning our markdown, I mean, I would certainly just check out. Um, the R Studio website. They've got really detailed tutorials. Um, they also have some really handy um, cheat sheets um, that explain the basics of this. That's funny. Um, those are actually right. You can get to those through R Studio. Oh yeah, that's right. But now you're going to tax my knowledge of. Uh, where, oh, they're right there. Thank you. Ah, oh, but they're, they're remotely hosted, so. <laughs> uh, lovely, but yeah, they've got these really good cheat sheets that walk through stuff. I mean, the thing I would honestly do is try to just uh, Google for this and find an example that looks like something that you want. Um, there's a ton of this content now floating around the internet that you can basically have, especially on GitHub. Um, take it, steal it. Uh, modify for your purposes, assuming it has a license that allows you to do that. Yeah, so I mean, um, in terms of learning the basics of R, there's a, a great book called R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham that's freely available online or in print if you'd like to, to get a physical copy of it um, that walks you through all the basics. Um, you know, the basics of Markdown really are honestly not any more complicated than understanding this basic structure and understanding a handful of these fundamentals of text formatting. Um, beyond that, there's really nothing else to learn about how to mark up a document to have it get you something that you want, unless you have these very kind of specific formatting requirements that you need to work with a specific template. Um, so that's what I'd recommend. R for Data Science by, by Wickham and uh, just learning the basics of, of Markdown. Uh, could be. It's definitely online. Just search R for data science, Hadley. There's only one Hadley in the R world. Yes? 
if you want to, if you want to, to see with uh, LaTeX, it doesn't appear, it doesn't mean that you have not installed it. Uh, yeah, there could be a, the same sort of dance of installing LaTeX and making sure that it uh, is recognized by our studio. Um, if it ends up in a non-standard place, that can cause a bit of chaos. But I can try and help you with it afterwards. Yeah. Any other? Do you want to uh, show the Git uh, incorporation? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, let me just walk through one thing, and then I will do that. So as I said, uh, chunk options, very easy to control. Whether that code is evaluated and displayed, evaluated, not displayed. Uh, not displayed, uh, and so forth. Um, you can also set those options globally, so for every chunk in the entire document, you don't have to retype that if in every case you want it evaluated but not displayed, should be a pretty standard choice. Um, R comes with a bunch of add-on packages that can handle printing, especially to LaTeX, a package called Xtable, or within NIDR itself, there's a function called Cable, which can handle different kinds of output. Uh, Garrett mentioned Stargazer, which is a really great regression uh, output formatting package that I'd highly recommend, uh, written by a guy at Harvard. Um, figure options in particular, so if you're producing a graph and you want that to be captioned, you want to have it be a certain size, those are all things you can specify in the chunk options. So you want the figure to be wide and short, square and so forth, that's all uh, manageable. Um, the other thing that's worth knowing is what Garrett just mentioned, which is that um, and now I'm having a complete, I actually don't use our studio, so I've been lying to you a little bit for the last uh, few minutes about how fantastic it is. Um, but I should show you Git integration. So if you create a new project, R has these, or our studio has these things called projects, let's start with that, in a new directory. Empty project, lovely. We would like to put this somewhere. We will put it in my downloads folder, and we will create a new folder. Example, select folder, create projects. Uh, uh, when you create a project, um, that will give you a bunch of additional functionality, which is not popping up for some reason. There it is. Um, project setup. You can connect this directly with Git. You say, Git, would you like to create a new repository? Yes, I would. That's fine. I will restart our studio. It will restart magically. And then what gets added is basically a really, really slimmed down uh, set of Git functionality directly within R. So you create an R project, and that can become, say, the basis for the sorts of projects we were working with in the previous session. You can stage and commit uh, changes that you make push and pull, and so forth. So rather than having to go to the git command line or using GitHub desktop, these kind of very, very basic uh, git functions are available to you within our studio if you set up a project. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then would it just be easily trans um, transferred into, a, into your git desktop? Exactly. So this will exist as a git repository. So like, um, I actually have to do something before this will work. So let me just quickly. Uh, we'll do something extremely boring. Yes, code.r, lovely. We will commit. You get this little pop-up window, which actually does have some of the visualization functionality that we were discussing in the command line um, session. Commit this, great, nothing to commit because I have to tick all of these things because I want them staged, staged, lovely, commit. You're getting the same commit message that you get on the command line. Close. Uh, if we go to, sorry, I know that's uh, jumping around a lot. I'm just going to where that project exists locally on my computer. You can see it's a Git repository. So if we do something like git log like we saw before, it exists. So the commits that I entered through our studio, or if I created new commits here on the command line, those would sync up with um, with our studio. I actually don't have GitHub Desktop on this computer, so I can't show you that interface. But it will. So yeah. basically, if I'm getting this right, the, um, this program in R will synthesize all of your documents. You can pull in all of these different sort of uh, statistical softwares and maybe other qualitative softwares, 
and then it's almost like a preparatory place, and then from there you can share it and put it into your gift. Totally, totally. So you know, our studio is a nice kind of general editor for using our code, um, but it's also got all this added on document preparation facility that's really useful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's all I wanted to show you. Um, so I don't know if there are any kind of final questions. Yeah. Uh, yes, it does. So if we look at, um, so anything that, so I should just say on GitHub in case I didn't discuss that uh, in my session, but maybe you did, anything that's a markdown document gets processed by GitHub automatically. So if you change that extension to .md, you get this look of this file as opposed to, um, let's see if this loads. Come on, Wi-Fi as opposed to its raw format, which is quite a bit um, less attractive. And there was a decision made at GitHub uh, several years ago to render our markdown documents um, through a markdown engine as well. So here you can see this is an unprocessed R markdown document, so it only has uh, the contents of the code chunks embedded in it as opposed to the output thereof. And if you clicked the raw button, you would get the raw source code of that that you'd see in our studio. Yeah. And now, in terms, in terms of transparency, having finished, having finished with, the, with the manuscript, do you mean that can you send the manuscript into a journal directly out to your phone? Yeah, so one of the nice things about those templates that I mentioned, which I will attempt to uh, show you possibly successfully, oh no, I don't have any of the, so um, a lot of journals have say LaTeX templates, for example, or a Word template. Um, you <laughs> should be able to load that relatively easily directly into RStudio so that the markdown gets coerced to LaTeX, filtered through that LaTeX template and then formatted correctly. So you actually, in many cases, shouldn't have to do any kind of journal specific formatting, assuming the journal has a LaTeX template that you can work with. Anything else? Okay. I guess that's it. Thanks, everyone.